you all for joining on today's webinar on how to improve your business with Lucitone Digital Printed Dentures. Today's webinar will be recorded, and if you have any questions throughout, just leave it in the Q&A box, and at the end, we'll try to answer as many as possible. For those of you that don't know our lab, Shaw Lab Group has been a Canadian dental lab leader since 1944. We've done this because we've evolved with the times, investing in the best technology that the market has to offer. We buy the best 3D printers, mills, scanners, and software. We do this because we want to offer our doctors and patients the best options for their restorative needs. Shaw Lab not only has locations in GTA, Kingston, London, and Ottawa, we're also part of a CDL group. CDL stands for Canadian Dental Laboratory. This is the largest group of premium Canadian dental laboratories across the country. You may know some of our partners, which is ProTech in BC and Hallmark in Halifax. This network allows us to provide our customers with the best resources and technology from coast to coast. Now, let's get into introducing our two uh, speakers today. So the first speaker is Jeffrey Luck. He's an RDT. He is our quality assurance supervisor in our GTA location. Jeff has been with Shaw Lab Group for about 12 years now, and he's also completed in the 2020 Master Cup uh, Championship for Dentures and came second place in the world. Jeff also takes a lot of pride in aesthetic dentistry, especially when it comes to 3D printed dentures. Our other speaker is Jamie Stover. He's a CDT, and he's a senior manager, manager for dental lab applications for carbon. Jamie brings more than 23 years of experience as a dental technician. He is also uh, a consultant for labs and dentists and improves and streamlines digital workflow. Jamie has been involved in many dental associations and he's been honored in for, with the 2021 NADL Award for Outstanding Achievement. Now, I want to again thank you, Jamie, for coming. Um, I'm going to hand it over to you and we can begin the, the webinar. Thank you again. Awesome, Mike. Thank you so much for that. Let's see if I can get my screen shared. We will be off to the races. I didn't realize um, Jeff, uh, Jeff's pretty humble. He didn't tell me about that, uh, that second place in the world Dentra Award. That's pretty cool. Nice job, Jeff. Okay. Can everybody see this? Are we good to go? We're good to go. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Uh, 6 p.m. Uh, after working hours in the East Coast. I'm actually in the Seattle area of uh, Washington State. Uh, so it's still only about 3 p.m. It's coffee time uh, for me. Uh, hopefully, you guys all had a great day. And uh, we're we're gonna talk about something today that I'm I'm you know super passionate about and really excited about at the same time um, where digital dentures are at specifically the 3D printed dentures that Shaw Group is doing um, can't say enough about this group if you already work with them you know that uh, just an amazing group of labs and people and uh, technicians with tons of experience and out there on the forefront with technology and materials so um, really really excited to be here. Um, don't panic by seeing this and please don't leave. <laughs> you are in the right place. <laughs> but I say this all the time when I'm talking to clinicians. My my older brother is a prosthodontist and uh, spent years working with him. We have conversations about digital dentistry and all the time. And um, you really, we're not talking about a new prosthesis. And I, you know, I really don't even like the term digital dentures. And we're going to, we're going to talk through the different ways dentures are made digitally analog. We're going to focus on um, you know, these 3D printed dentures that, that Shaw is doing and some different workflows. And uh, like um, we were saying in the beginning there, if you have questions, feel free to type them along the way in the, in the Q&A um, box and, uh, or the chat box. And we, we're going to save about 10 minutes at the end or a little more than that and answer your questions live. So, um, but we're not talking about a new prosthesis. What we're talking about is a new way to make acrylic dentures, not even really a new way, a newer way, right? Because we've been 3D printing dentures now for um, five, six, seven years, believe it or not. Um, <clears throat> but materials matter. 
And we're going to uh, distinguish the different materials that Shaw are using from a lot of what's out there on the market. But this is the truth, guys. Acrylic dentures have been in use since uh, since 1938. So we're approaching 90 years. And what this basically is, is making an acrylic denture on a 3D printer instead of uh, the traditional way that we make them. We're just talking about a new production process. So think about it instead of a new product to get our minds wrapped around a new product is scary. It's untrusted. There's lots of reasons why we should avoid them for a long time until they're proven. This is the same denture product, simplified workflow with so many benefits for clinicians and patients. And we're going to cover those next, but we're really just talking about the evolution of technology. And we're talking about the evolution. There's an example of the ways that dentures can be produced in the world today. And this is why I don't like saying digital dentures. I don't like saying digital dentistry. It's just for one, it's white noise. Everything's digital. You know, even if you're taking analog impressions, you send them to Shaw and you request, uh, you know, a zirconia crown or a 3D printed denture, they're going to convert those analog impressions to digital data. So you're a digital dentist, whether you're taking traditional impressions or you have an intraoral scanner. So really, we should just call it dentistry. <laughs> That's really what we're doing. We're doing dentistry. Um, traditional uh, fabrication of dentures, the analog way, is extremely time consuming and labor intensive. It takes skilled technicians hours and hours at the bench with their hands. Uh, it takes you five, four, five, six or more appointments back and forth right? You know, initial impression, uh, you know, custom tray, final impression, wax rims, wax trying, or you have to wiggle teeth around and wax. You shouldn't have to. Why do you have to? Because that's just the way it is, right? You don't have to with this process. We'll talk about that. But there's also with traditional uh, fabrication, no matter how good the technician is, no matter how skilled and experienced the removable technician is, and the clinician, no matter how skilled the clinician is, do you ever ask yourself, I, I'm, a, I'm a darn good clinician. I'm taking good impressions, good bite records. I'm communicating with my lab. You know, I got a great lab. Why does the denture not fit after five appointments? I still have to do adjustments. It's, it's because of the process, guys. And I have a lot of friends that are engineers. And if you know any engineers, ask them about copy error. Copy error is a, is a phenomenon that, that creeps into production processes when there's lots of steps there's just more room to introduce copier. When you're starting with something, uh, a very accurate initial impression, by the time you do all the production steps, and I'm not even talking about the back and forth, but think about the lab, what they're dealing with, with expansion of materials, when they're duplicating models, when they're you know processing acrylic, no wonder these things don't fit exactly 100% of the time. So what we do when we move a process to digital, is we we cut out a lot of the opportunity for copy error. We're, we're, we're cutting out production steps. We're using digital technology to both design and manufacture, and we're just eliminating the copy error. And that's why digital uh, prosthesis, both fixed and removable, generally fit uh, quite a bit better. When a process goes digital, a manufacturing process moves to digital, it usually goes to milling first. And mill dentures have been on the market for over a decade. And while you can produce a decent denture uh, with a mill, it's not very efficient because anytime you're milling a material, it's a wasteful process inherently because you're starting with a large mass of material and you're, you're cutting out just the part you need or the parts you need. You're throwing the rest away. Maybe a portion of it gets recycled. Also, the production process to run a mill and, and cut an acrylic is, is very slow. You have, to, you have to slow the speed of the, of the burr in the mill way down. Um, when you're milling a material like zirconia or some type of a glass ceramic, um, you can you can spin that burr faster. Uh, it's a harder material. Uh, but when you're when you're cutting a plastic or an acrylic, you'll melt it. So it takes labs hours in a mill to mill one denture arch, where you can produce many denture arches much quicker in a 3D printer with less waste. Let's talk about 3D printed dentures. I said they've been on the market for you know five, six, seven years. They have in the generation one materials. Now, if you don't hear anything else, there's a few things that you could, you know, you could take a nap, right? During this presentation, if you so choose to, you don't want to miss a few key things. <laughs> Number one is big difference in the materials that are available in the market. And why I want to stop here for a second and focus on this is that I know clinicians are being marketed to heavily 
for printed denters, 3D printed denters. The, the truth of the matter is, guys, the fact is that a lot of these companies that are marketing to you want to sell you these generation one materials and try to sell you on the, the fantasy that you can mill or that you can print your own dentures in your office very simply and easily. So, you know, that's for a whole nother conversation. But if we focus on the strength of the materials, I can tell you that the generation one 3D printed materials, everything on the market that you see today um, for 3D printed denture resins except for two materials, one being the Lucitone digital print uh, material here that, uh, that Shaw is using are the generation one materials. And they're okay, they have their indications, they're okay for temporary, for immediate dentures, but they tend to be brittle, they are not high impact strength and they lack aesthetics. So in, a matter of fact, if you hold these materials, you know, five, six feet high, drop them on the floor, they'll shatter into many, into many pieces. So. Again, they're okay and they're indicated and they're FDA cleared for certain, you know, uh, you know, certain indications and applications, but, you know, trust them for long-term final restorations. I do not. The LDP material from Densply Serona, Lucitone Digital Print, it hit the market almost five years ago and it changed the game because it is the first, it was the first and remains uh, one of only two high impact rated uh, denture, 3D printed denture solutions on the market. So there's, let's talk about the workflow of dentures. So again, I'm just going to say, remember, <clears throat> we do not need to have an intraoral scanner. If we do, very slick workflows we can show you and that we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes here in the Q&A with Jeff. But um, <clears throat> let's just talk about, you know, if you're starting with a traditional impression, um, and again, Jeff can go more into, you know, all those steps. They've actually figured out a way to, um, to, to cut at least one appointment out of the traditional workflow, which is pretty amazing. But after we get to the bite block stage or the wax rim stage, we're not going to do a wax try in. What they're going to do is they're going to scan those bite blocks with one of their lab scanners, and they're going to import those into their denture design software and they're gonna design a try-in based on you know, your prescription. So <clears throat> if you haven't been to a lab for a while and you have not seen the amazing software uh, that Shaw has to, to design these dentures, it's, it's pretty mind blowing. All the tools that a technician has at the bench with their hands, they have digitally with the design software. They have virtual articulators, <clears throat> they have you know, all the wax knives, they can, you know, take the teeth individually, you know, move them around however you want. They can grab the whole arch of teeth, move them around. It's really impressive. Um, and so what they're going to do is they're going to produce a try-in. Now, this is where things get really interesting. And this is where some of the, the, the benefits really creep in to the process here is we don't have to now wiggle teeth around in wax while the patient sits in the chair because things, you know, aren't quite the way that they should be. Um, you know, what we do is we basically take a monolithic try and it looks like what you see on the screen here. It's a functional try and so it's stronger than a wax try and if you wanted to send the patient home with it for a couple of days, absolutely can do that. Okay, you can absolutely send it home with the uh, with the patient. Um, you can um, patients can take it home and trial very easy to indicate changes. It feels like the denture. It feels like the final denture. So, um, you know, it's the same material as the final denture. So the suction, the fit is very similar to what the final denture is going to feel like. Um, and then it, it, it can also be delivered as uh, with the final as an emergency or backup denture. So if you think about, again, some of those patients, the demographic, maybe the convalescent care facilities, you know, if you can, if that, that try and fits pretty well and what labs and clinicians have figured out over the last, you know, five years that they've been really, you know, iterating on these processes is that there's less adjustments <clears throat> needed with these 3D printed dentures than there are with traditional wax try-ins. And so, the, you know, the majority of these cases, there's very little that needs to change. And so these, these try-ins, can be sent with the final denture as an emergency backup, which is which is pretty cool. You cannot do that with a traditional with a traditional denture, right? The try in the wax try in becomes the final denture. <clears throat> but you know, including my prosthodontist brother, a lot of times dentists will, will say to me, you know, but okay, well, this, this looks a little different. I can't move the teeth around. I'm confused. How do I how do I relate changes to the lab? It's so simple. 
So if you can take a, a little Sharpie like you see here, and you can just easily indicate the changes right on this try-in. So you can say, hey, the midline's off a little bit. Please move the midline over to where it's indicated. You know, you can add wax or acrylic to this. This is an acrylic denture. So acrylic will stick to it. Wax will stick to it really well. You could add a little wax or acrylic and say, hey, please lengthen, you know, the laterals as I've indicated on number 10 with this wax or with this acrylic. You can grind on the occlusion, adjust the occlusion. You can add acrylic or wax to the occlusion. You can take a wash impression if for some reason it doesn't fit right. You can take another bite, use a bite registration. So simple to indicate the changes to the lab. And what they will basically do is take this try-in back from you. They can scan this try-in right into their software, overlay it with the final denture design, and then make those requested changes for you that will be indicated in the final denture. So um, it's a it's a streamlined process. It's not only are we you know eliminating some appointments because of the the workflow, but the try-in process is much much simpler and also much more comprehensive if you'd like it to be. Again, the patient has been a cheek biter. If the phonetics haven't been right with their existing denture, let them take it home and try it for a couple of days and come on back and then uh, relay any of those. Uh, by taking a, a patient's existing denture and using that as the starting point, the copy denture workflow and also the reference denture workflow, using the patient's denture as a starting point and requesting some changes, but still you're, you're skipping the first couple impression steps, right? You're skipping the wax rim step. You're basically using a patient's existing denture. There's so much information there. Uh, you know, you typically, you have the midline established. You have uh, a proper video. You have uh, correct occlusion, phonetics. Um, <clears throat> typically, the two shape is what the patient's happy with. If not, now's the time to make some changes. Usually what happens, as we know, is patients will lose bone. The denture won't fit as well. And so what we do is we take a patient's existing denture, do a wash impression, capture that, do a bite, you know, an impression of the patient's um, uh, opposing. And if you have an internal scanner, it's a very efficient workflow because appointment number one, the patient comes, gets their denture relined, gets the impression, you pull the relined material out, the impression material out, not relined, uh, wash impression, but you pull that impression material out after scanning the, the denture, you send the patient home with their denture on appointment number one. You send this information to the lab digitally. You can see on the right-hand side of the screen there, they import it into their design software and they either make some changes based on the prescription, the request that you're asking for. Maybe we want to change the shape of the teeth a little bit. Maybe we want to, you know, change somehow the position of the teeth, or we want to move the midline over a little bit. That can all be done. But a lot of times, just copy the patient's existing denture with capturing their um, bone and tissue location. If you don't have an intraoral scanner, um, don't worry, you can still participate in this workflow. Take a patient's existing denture, do a wash impression, take the bite records, the impression of the opposing, send all that to the lab. What Shaw's gonna do, they're gonna use one of their lab scanners, scan all those parts in, import it into their design software, only change in this is that we got to get that, that denture back to that patient. So we either ship that back to, to you at the clinic or the patient comes by the lab or picks it up. And again, if you have questions about that workflow, Jeff will be your best resource here in a couple of minutes when he pops on for the Q&A. But very, very interesting workflow. Um, you know, copy reference dentures. This is kind of some easy guidelines you can go by here. Basically, a copy denture the most simplified terms, we're not doing a lot of changes. The patient is pretty darn happy with their existing denture. Maybe the teeth are stained because they drink way more wine and coffee than they tell you when they come to their hygiene appointments. But um, maybe we just want to brighten up the teeth. Maybe, you know, again, the fit of the denture is usually the number one, um, you know, issue or concern for a patient. And we can capture the position of their bone and tissue by using their existing denture with a wash impression. Reference dentures, few more changes. Maybe the patient has not been happy with the shape of their teeth. They want them a little more square. They want them a little more round. Maybe they want their, you know, <clears throat> their, you know, seven through 10, they want them to be a little bit longer. Uh, maybe their phonetics have not been good. They've been a cheek biter. The lab can, can make those changes in the software and then uh, send you a try-in <clears throat> to try and to see if those, uh, those changes have been, um, have been uh, done, performed accurately. Um, I want to show you one other thing here, uh, or one other application that Shaw is doing that's very interesting. 
We talk about 36 in the US, what, 36 million people are fully edentulous, another 120 million people missing at least one tooth. Who does a lot of flippers, partials? We all do, right? There's a lot of them that need to be done. <clears throat> Shaw's using the same material and the same process, very similar to produce 3D printed dentures and partials. You can do that as you see here by uh, incorporating metal clasps. They have a way when clasps are needed for retention to incorporate metal clasps in these particles. You can see though, there's no metal framework, right? It is because we know this is 3000 joules per meter squared when it's in a patient's mouth at body temperature, it's incredibly strong. We don't necessarily need to always have a metal framework to put, to stick some acrylic onto and stick some teeth into. <clears throat> you can also do it without clasps. This is what we call a flipper, um, you know, we getting retention um, across the, the aprons here without <clears throat> clasps. That's a pretty nice looking uh, flipper there. So other indications that uh, that I'm sure Shaw would want to talk to you about, and I'm sure that uh, some light bulbs are going off now in your mind, like, oh my gosh, I just did a patient today that this would have been perfect for, right? Um, and I, we're going to move on to the Q&A. Jeff, please join us and uh, let's see if we have any questions. Or if not, I know Jeff has um, uh, some slides he wants to show as well. Jeff, just let me know if you want me to click through those when we get going here and I'll just change them for you. So yeah, sounds good. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you for all that great information. Uh, it's really exciting to see, um, you know, 3D printing and how far advanced it's become. Um, I'm going to talk about our workflow here at Shaw and what we need um, from you guys to, to start making these dentures. So <clears throat> yeah, so for new dentures, um, we're going to start with a preliminary impression. Now, this can come in as an alginate. It can come in as a digital scan. Um, and we'll take this. We'll fabricate the occlusal rim. And you're going to take this occlusal rim and do your, you're your. going to use this as your bite registration and custom tray at the same time. Uh, actually, go back. Not yet. Uh, yep. There we go. Um, so yeah, you're going you're gonna to use this occlusal rim as your custom tray final impression. Um, with tray adhesive, do a light body wash, have that seed in the mouth, and then take the bite record. You're going to do uh, some contours of that rim, give us as much information as possible um, to get the most accurate, most predictable trine. And from there, we'll generate that trine. We call it a prototype, um, the monolithic prototype. And from there, um, we'll send it to you. You can try in the mouth, send the patient home. They can test it out. Uh, like Jamie said, they can go home, you can have a meal with it, um, you know, have a few conversations, take some selfies, really test it out, which you don't get to do with the traditional wax trine. Um, the patient comes in, you put the wax trine in the mouth, and they have it in the mouth for a couple of minutes, maybe half an hour, and then they go home. So they don't really get to try it out and, and see if it works for them and see if they like it. Um, but with this prototype, they, they're able to um, really find out if it's working for them. And if it's all, if it's, if they're happy with it, they can, they can hang on to it, just let you know, um, and then have you guys send us a prescription. We can produce the final from there. We don't even need that trying back. Now, if there are adjustments that need to be made in the trying, we do need that trying back. So if there's any uh, clues adjustments, uh, resets, um, or wash impression, we do have to take that trying back to rescan and redesign. Um, but yeah, if that trine is is perfect, we just need a lab script to say go to final. Um, so we can go next slide. Um, and then this top, this is the the workflow for the reference denture. Um, so we have the uh, existing patients or existing denture from the patient, and if they're pretty happy with it, if it's not too worn out, um, and and functions pretty well, we can take that. Um, and pretty much skip, like again, skip that custom tray, skip the bite block, pretty much take the final impression in that. Um, we'll scan it in and go straight to a try. Now the try in, we put optional, we always advise to do the try in just to make sure everything's okay. Um, you know, we're pretty confident with our skills, with our technique, but we still recommend, highly recommend that try in just to make sure. Um, and then from there, same thing, they can take it home, try it out, and go to final. Um, and with the um, existing denture, with the reference denture workflow, 
um, again, we, we well, I'm going to talk about later, but uh, um, we need to, you need, it needs to be sent into the lab for us to scan. Um, we do take um, walk, well, we don't take walk-ins, but we, we allow for the patients to, after they get that, that wash impression, they can come to the lab, you know, they, they just spend half an hour at the lab, we'll scan it in and return that denture to them. So we do offer this service. And if you're a local clinic and, and, you, and you have a patient that is looking to do a reference denture or even a copy denture, uh, take that wash impression, send, book a time, send them to the lab, um, we'll scan it and return it back to the patient. So they'll have their denture back uh, within the same day. And can go to the next slide. So um, like we mentioned, you don't need an IO scanner to do digital dentures. We, we actually only take final physical impressions. That's because we need tissue compression. Uh, scanners aren't able to capture tissue compression, which we need for palatal seal, uh, for suction, for stability. So um, if you have a scanner though, it is an advantage um, because what you can do is take that wash impression and use your uh, IO scanner and just scan it by hand. Chair side, um, send us the scan and return the denture back to the patient. Now, each scanner has their own scan strategy for scanning a denture. Um, and we always recommend to speak to your rep, um, call them in, get, get the scan strategy, um, get them in for some training just to make sure you're scanning these dentures uh, correctly. We have received a few scans um, and, you know, there's, because of the difficulties, we have to call the clinic and say, hey, there's a lot of distortion. There's some artifacts. Uh, we do need a rescan. So um, really talk to your reps, get that scan strategy in, um, and, and get a few practice scans in. Uh, the challenge with scanning a denture is that the, the surface of the denture is so smooth and so polished, the scanners have issues stitching the images together because there's no reference points. So um, with their scan strategy, it allows for more reference points. Uh, we also recommend to use some kind of scan spray. Um, a typical one you can easily get is from the pharmacy, your, your athlete foot powder spray. Um, scan that, um, spray that on the denture, it'll mat it out and it will, it will reduce the reflective surfaces and help you get a more accurate scan. So that's one tip uh, we give. And when we scan the dentures in the lab, we always use scan spray. Um, just to maximize that accuracy. Um, so again, reach out to your scan reps, uh, your scanner reps to get that scan strategy in. And we'll go to the next slide. So um, just want to quickly go over um, some components for success, how to really narrow down that uh, appointment time to three appointments. Um, some components for success, we, we always recommend um, really adjusting those occlusal rims. Now our technicians, we design occlusal rims on an indentulous model. We have no reference except for the anatomical, anatomical landmarks on the model. So they'll make a textbook wax rim, um, but we need the clinicians to modify those wax rims to the proper buckle contours, the proper video, um, you know, mark down midline, smile line, canine line for us. Um, register the right video and and we always ask for photos you know profile photos um a, a shot of the rim in the mouth with them smiling at rest um these photos go a long way to help the technicians um you know really understand that bite block to help choose the molds for the teeth um and and they we can usually see from these photos if other adjustments need to be made if there's too much lip support not enough lip support um or if there's anything weird, we can um, definitely look at the photo and give you a call to discuss it. Um, there's also little tools out there. Um, a new newer tool that's gained some popularity is the Conmedior gauge. It's to help um, measure out the video. Now, it, it uses, it, there's a photo here on the far right. Um, and this little tool uh, uses face facial measurements to give you more of a golden proportion for video. It's it's a tool to help. It works well, I guess, for younger patients. Um, older patients with resorbed ridge, collapsed by malocclusion, it's good for a guideline, but won't give you the most accurate video. But again, it's a good guideline to work from. So um, a, definitely a cool tool to check out. There's, there's YouTube videos on how to use it. And it looks a little funny, but it's pretty, pretty interesting to see how this tool works. Um, so again, there's tools out there to help with scanning for measuring video. Um, a, a lot of tools 
created just because of this uh, digital denture workflow um, and, and to aid in the, in the process. So we'll go to the next slide. Actually, I think that was it. Should be one more slide, but the- Oh yeah, there we, there go. we go. Yeah. So lastly, um, for the impressions, we recommend to have PVS, we recommend to have tray adhesive, um, especially with wash impressions, um, and, and light body PVS, it can get thin. So having that tray adhesive in the denture uh, for the wash impression in the bite block will guarantee that everything stays where it is. When sometimes the impression gets thin and gets sent to us, um, there's movement, there's some banging around the boxes from the delivery. Um, those really thin wash impressions uh, come apart and it, it's really hard to place back and will affect the scan. So. Again, something really good to have in the in the clinic is tray adhesive. Um, we recommend to do border molding uh, with heavy body on the rim if you need. Um, for those who still are comfortable with the custom tray to do a final impression, um, you know we accept that too. We can definitely scan that in and and use that to fabricate the wax rim as well. Um, but yeah, we recommend highly recommend tray adhesive um, to be used. So other than that, um, like we said, we, we do offer for um, patients to come in with that wash impression. We can scan it with our desktop scanners, um, especially for those who have trouble with IO scans, who've not had enough practice with their IO scan for scanning dentures. We do offer that. They come in for half an hour, we'll scan it, return the denture back, and we can move on to um, the, the prototype try-in. So that pretty much wraps it up for the workflow um, and we can enter into the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jamie. So just want to be mindful of time. So just a couple of questions that we can get into and uh, get answered. So one of the questions uh, is, can I design in-house and send to you for printing? So right now, um, we're only accepting cases start to finish. Um, we're working on... I guess a policy to accept um, piecework, but right now we're, we're, we want to take full responsibility for the designs for everything that happens, and you know we have a great warranty that we will cover manufacturing defects. And um, again, for us to take full responsibility, we we right now only take cases start to finish. Thanks. Uh, next question is: If a tooth comes out, can it be repaired? Uh, with any tooth company and can it be cold cured to the material or does it have to be use the bonder? Um, validated materials, yes, the bonder, uh, HIPAA. Um, I mean, I, we've done some testing. If you really need it and you're in a pinch, you can repair with cold cure. It seems to bond really well, just have it sandblasted. But again, validated protocols, use the bonder, um, use HIPAA. Um, and I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Jamie. Uh, no, I, that's, I agree with that. It's also, I mean, having the, the correct tooth would be the issue as well, right? Cause you guys, have yes. been, you know, designed that tooth, printed that tooth or used a specific carded tooth that, uh, the clinician most likely wouldn't have on hand in their, in their office. So they, yeah. uh, that would be a, a, a big, uh, you know, uh, you know, possible issue as well. Yeah. But again, in a pinch, if if they really need, you know, again, emergency happens, they're flying out, and that that evening, and they need a tooth placed in, I'm sure, you know, you can stick some something close in there and bond it with acrylic. Uh, one question might be more towards Jamie, and it's actually two questions. I'll summarize into ones, but uh, some of them are asking, how does carbon pin printers compare to smaller printers that are out on the market? Yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, and you know, to be honest with you, we don't, uh, we don't even really market. Um, we don't have that, that many clinicians that have carbon printers, um, <clears throat> largely because our printers are for a lot more throughput, a lot more volume. So a, a lab like Shaw, you know, they have a lot of cases, they, they need production capacity and throughput. Um, <clears throat> the biggest difference is just the speed of our printers and the amount of cases that you can put through them um, are, are probably more than the average small small chair side printer. We, we actually don't fabricate a chair side printer. We only fabricate the, the larger production machine. So, mm -hmm. um, Another two questions I'll put into one uh, is basically for CAS partials, is this an option or for an, uh, another one is just saying it for partial. So for partial dentures, can we use uh, 3D printed dentures? 
Yeah, so right now we are fabricating uh, partial acrylic dentures, 3D printed. Um, we do a lot, actually, we do a lot of flippers uh, with IO scans. So um, that's one thing we will take IO scans for. Um, we know sometimes after an extraction, uh, you know, a physical compression might be difficult. So we do take IO scans for flippers. Uh, we do for fabricate a lot of those partial dentures. We still prefer a physical impression. Um, cast partial wise, um, I know there are some techniques out there for designing 3D printed um, components for the cast partial, but right now we are not uh, offering that. Um, we're waiting, I guess, a little, for a little bit more validation um, to proceed with that. Uh, it is possible, but at the moment we're not doing that. Uh, another question here is, is this similar to flexible dentures you see advertised and dentures with white flexible clasps? Uh, no. So those are acetyl resins um, or valplast. Those are uh, vinyl based, uh, usually through heat injection. There is a milled Duraflex puck, um, but that, that material is specifically made uh, as a flexible denture. Um, we have designed um, some flippers, some acrylic partials with um, the Lucitone base extending as clasps. And um, we've actually had great feedback with it. So um, we've been kind of pushing the boundaries with this material, um, getting some unique designs in, but we, we, we are getting some good results with just having this material um, being its own clasp. Um, I think in the future, there's a flexible material coming out for carbon, um, which we'll probably um, use in the future. But right now, um, this is different from flexible, but I mean, it's we've been getting great feedback for those who uh, we can't make a flexible denture for, maybe because of limited space. Um, and we've offered them a, a digital print with uh, a lucid home base clasp, and they, they've been pretty happy with it. Thanks. A couple of people are asking about price and fee guides. I'm going to have marketing uh, email everybody our fee guide and pricing for this. Uh, so we'll save that for uh, so it's not answer, a questions and answer. Uh, another question here, are patients noticing a difference between uh, 3D printed dentures versus traditional acrylic dentures? Um, no, I don't. We haven't had much feedback for patients knowing the difference. Um, if anything, we get the clinicians uh, giving us the feedback saying, you know, this try and looks different. What do I do with it? Um, but I think the patients are pretty happy. We've, we've been making these since 2019. Um, and I haven't had any of them come back broken or any issues with it since then. So, um, you know, I, I don't think the patients really know the difference on their end. It, to them, it's still just a, a great denture. Yeah, I just add to that. The only uh, usually what patients will notice the fit. They'll, they'll just say, "Oh my gosh, the fit, the suction is so so much better than my traditional denture." Um, you know, so they'll comment on the fit. They'll comment on, um, you know, sometimes they'll comment on the durability of it. Right, my denture fell in the sink and it didn't break. <laughs> Things like that. But um, as far as uh, it's it's all usually the what the patients will uh, comment on is the the, the very positive uh, improvements. Actually, a quick note on that too. Actually, we've done a few copy dentures where um, they they wanted a copy denture for their backup, but then they ended up liking their copy denture more than their existing denture. So, um, yeah, there have been that kind of feedback. <laughs> right. Um, I think you guys already answered this. Uh, somebody was asking if it works for cast partials. So you you are doing it on cast partials, Jeff? Uh, no, not right now. There there is a process out there. People are doing it, but we're we're not doing it here Valid. in our lab. Yeah, it's not validated. Okay. Uh, another question here is, um, conventional dentures are pretty thin in some areas. Can 3D printed dentures be thin in those areas? So like in the tuberosities and stuff like that. Um, I, I think in, in certain aspects, we can get thinner with the 3D printed material. We still stick to our traditional uh, recommended minimal thickness or ideal thickness of about two and a half millimeters. Um, Again, it, it depends. If you're looking at a flipper with, you know, a narrow connector to the to the pontic and that's two millimeters thin, then you know, again, that's pushing 
material way beyond its limits, um, it very likely will fracture. But if you're looking at a, a full denture with, you know, areas of two millimeter at the tuberosity or, or, or certain areas, there's still substantial uh, resin around it. And we can, we can say that um, the strength is there. Well, it looks like we're about 15 minutes over, but we've answered all the questions. Uh, so I kind of want to wrap it up and I want to thank everyone for joining and have a great night. Thank you guys so much. Really enjoyed being part of this. Thank you to the attendees. Thanks, Jeff, Mike, whole team at Shaw. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Have a, great Have a night. great evening. Thank you, everyone.